Old Testament to the book of Joshua. Uh, Last Lord's Day, we looked at verses 13 through 15 of Joshua 5. And we're going to begin reading there in verse 13 of Joshua 5. And we'll read through uh, into verse 20. Uh, Our text is verses 1 through 16 of uh, Joshua chapter 6. Well known passage of the Word of God concerning uh, the victory that God gave uh, to the children of Israel over the city of Jericho. We begin reading in uh, verse 13 of chapter 5. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thy, into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valour. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once, thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on, and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord." And it came to pass, when Joshua had spoken unto the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord, and blew with the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the rear reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city going about at once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets, And the armed men went before them, but the rear reward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp, so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that were sent, that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. 
So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpets and it came to pass and the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout. The wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him and they took the city. And again, may the Lord bless to us his word as we read it there in the book of Joshua. The children of Israel's conquest of Jericho is one of the outstanding and yet perhaps uh, most unexplained events of the Old Testament scriptures. Indeed, what's recorded in Joshua 6 is so amazing that many secular scientists and scholars uh, question the truthfulness of the account. Uh, Such thinking is fortified by the fact that archaeologists uh, have failed to really uncover any traces of the ancient city of Jericho. This has led to a consensus among scientists that the account recorded in Joshua chapter 6 has its origins not in truth, Uh, but in the nationalistic propaganda of the kings of Judah. In other words, many in the scientific community are of the opinion that the events recorded in Joshua 6 never occurred. But that's not the view of Scripture, nor is it the view that finds acceptance amongst Bible-believing Christians. Undoubtedly, what occurred at Jericho was a miracle performed by God. Indeed, as is plain from Joshua chapter 6, God was at work in the extraordinary things that occurred at Jericho. What is evident is that God gave Jericho into the hands of the children of Israel. The event from beginning to end was the doing of God. He was the one who devised the plan of attack a plan of attack from a military perspective that was novel, uh, to say the least. In summary, this was the plan. For six days, the children of Israel were to march around the walls of Jericho. They were to make one circuit of the city on each of those six days. Those circuits of the city were to be undertaken in silence, the only sound being that of ram's horns blown by the priests. And then on the seventh day, the children of Israel were to go around the city seven times. And that having been done, the priests were then to sound the ram's horns and the people to shout with a great shout. Now this was the plan that the captain of the army of the Lord had provided to the children of Israel. This was the Lord's plan to enable the children of Israel to begin to take possession of their inheritance in the land of Canaan. This battle plan also provides the fundamental blueprint uh, for uh, believers today, provides a fundamental blueprint uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ today as we collectively and individually seek to conquer our Jerichos. In other words, as we seek to overcome those enemies and those obstacles that prevent us from entering into fully the blessings of our spiritual inheritance. What occurred at Jericho sets before every believer what is required if we will enter into the blessings purchased for us by Jesus Christ at the cross. We do well to remember, brethren, that all of these events in the Old Testament scriptures were not just simply accounts that are of perhaps interest to the history of God's people in that day and age. As Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, uh, he says there, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And uh, we, we look at this passage this morning with uh, that in mind. I want to look at this word of God then this morning under the theme, Faith's Conquest of Jericho. We look at uh, the uh, sermon under these three headings, an act of faith, secondly, an abiding significance, and then finally, an assured victory. 
You will have noticed that Joshua 5 ends with uh, Joshua uh, conducting surveillance of the city of Jericho in preparation for a potential assault upon that city. And as we uh, read even this morning in the last few verses of chapter 5, as he undertook that survey of the city, uh, Joshua was actually taken by surprise by a man dressed as a soldier uh, and this man had his sword uh, drawn in his hand. Challenged by Joshua as regards his allegiances, this man revealed himself to be the captain of the host or army of the Lord. This man was none other than the pre-incarnate Christ, uh, the second person of the Trinity in human form. And here he appears to Joshua centuries before his birth in Bethlehem, Bethlehem to the Virgin Mary. Now by his appearance and by what he said, it's obvious that this man, this captain of the army of the Lord, uh, had come to lead the children of Israel in their conquest of Canaan. The chapter divisions between chapters 5 and 6 uh, are a little problematic. Uh, it may at first appear that the captain of the army of the Lord, having told Joshua to take the shoes from off his feet because he was standing on holy ground, it appears that perhaps he, first, he then departed without any further conversation uh, between himself and Joshua. Uh, but that is clearly not the case. Now, the first five verses of chapter 6 actually belong to verses 13 through 15 of chapter 5. The connection is this. In verses 2 through 5 of chapter 6, the captain of the army of the Lord outlines to Joshua the plan of attack for the children of Israel as regards the city of Jericho. Chapter 6 actually begins really with a parenthetical comment in verse 1. And by a parenthetical comment, I mean an additional or intervening comment, which in some respects is unrelated to the main thought under consideration. And there in that parenthetical comment, uh, uh, we find attention is drawn to the defensive uh, posture of the city of Jericho. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And then in verse 2, the captain of the army of the Lord uh, proceeds to address Joshua. We read there, And the Lord said unto Joshua, and the Lord refer reference there in verse 2 is not only to uh, the uh, God of the covenant, but it's referable to the captain of the army of the Lord. And the captain of the army of the Lord then proceeds in the following verses to assure Joshua that the children of Israel would be victorious uh, as regards the city of Jericho. And he lays out in detail the way in which the children of Israel would actually overcome the city of Jericho. Jericho was located only seven kilometres west of the place where the children of Israel had crossed the Jordan into Canaan. And Jericho, as such, was a city of strategic importance. It was a well-fortified city. And as such, Jericho was actually the key to the entire country or land of Canaan. If the children of Israel could take Jericho then it would be evident that the city, that no city rather in Canaan uh, would be able to stand against the children of Israel. Furthermore, from a military perspective, the taking of Jericho would open up the whole of the interior of the land of Canaan to the children of Israel. Given its strategic importance, not surprisingly, Jericho uh, was well fortified. Indeed, it was surrounded by a substantial wall. Some indication of the size uh, of the wall can be gauged from the fact 
that uh, we know from other parts of the book of Joshua that houses were actually built upon the walls of Jericho. With the children of Israel camped so close to Jericho, the city itself, of course, at this point in time, was completely shut up. No one came out, no one came in. Jericho was on guard. The reputation of the children of Israel and the defeats that they inflicted upon the Moabites and the Ammonites on the eastern side of the Jordan uh, had preceded them. With Jericho so close and considering its importance to the taking of the whole of the land of Canaan, uh, no doubt Joshua would have been considering how best the children of Israel uh, might mount an attack upon that city. God had assured him that he would give the children of Israel the land of Canaan. And furthermore, he had assured, him, uh, assured them that he would drive out the Canaanites from before them. But God had not yet revealed how that would be accomplished. Given his military background, Joshua's thoughts as he surveyed Jericho uh, probably would have led him to consider some of the forms of physical assault that were common upon a city such as Jericho. But the reality was that the children of Israel, of course, had spent the last 40 years in the wilderness and in truth they were not uh, sufficiently skilled, experienced or equipped for an assault upon a city like Jericho. The alternatives available to Joshua, therefore, would have been extremely limited. Uh, possibly he contemplated uh, the burning or the battering down of the gates of the city. That was a common way in which access was gained to walled cities in that day. An alternative was the laying siege to such cities. Uh, there were also the use of catapults and of uh, ramps uh, to uh, assault such walled cities. But what we do know is that whatever Joshua was contemplating, it is certain that the battle plan proposed by the captain of the army of the Lord uh, was not among them. The plan given to Joshua by the captain of the army of the Lord was not only simple, but from a military standpoint, it was absurd. The children of Israel were to march around the outskirts of Jericho each day for six days in succession. Now, the order in which they were to march was first the armed men, followed by the seven priests who were to blow seven trumpets of ram's horns, and uh, then the seven priests with the ram's horn in turn were to be followed by priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant. And after them, there was to follow the balance of the armed men as well as the people. The only sound to be heard, according to this plan, of the captain of the army of the Lord was the sound of the blowing of the ram's horns. The armed men and the priests were to march in complete silence, as were the people. They were to do this for six consecutive days. And then according to this plan of the captain of the army of the Lord, on the seventh day, instead of going around the city only once, the children of Israel were to march around Jericho seven times. And the conclusion of the seventh time, the seven priests bearing the ram's horns were to blow long on their trumpets and the men and the people were to shout with a great shout. This was the shout of victory. As improbable as this plan seemed to be, the children of Israel followed it to the letter. Whatever strategies Joshua had developed for conquering Jericho were laid aside. For six days, the children of Israel, with the Ark of the Covenant in their midst, walked around Jericho. Day after day, one circuit of the city each day, then they returned to their camp. Now, that would have been a strange sight, no doubt, uh, for the citizens of Jericho. Uh, no... No mounds were being erected, no catapults were being deployed, no battering rams, no fire, no swords were even drawn. Just a company of men accompanied by the children of Israel 
walking around the city. In the midst of them, the golden covered chest of the Ark of the Covenant. And they walked around the city uh, quietly for six days. Each day they started early in the morning, walked around the city once, and then they returned to their camp. The only sound that could be heard was the noise of the seven priests blowing the ram's horns. Weird. But none of this appeared to pose any threat to the safety and security of Jericho. No doubt as the days passed, any initial concern that was occasioned by the presence of the children of Israel so close to Jericho uh, would have given way perhaps to mild amusement among the citizens of Jericho as this daily ritual was performed. It appeared that the citizens of Jericho had nothing to fear from the children of Israel. But then on the seventh day, the children of Israel rose before dawn. Again, the armed men with the Ark of the Covenant in their midst walked about Jericho, followed uh, by uh, the people. But this day was different. The Canaanites' cup of iniquity had become full to overflowing. And the day of God's judgment had come for the citizens of Jericho. On this day, the children of Israel, having circumnavigated the city, did not return uh, to their camp. Instead, they continued to march around the city, and they did that seven times, and they did that in silence. And then as the Canaanites watched from the apparent security of the walls of Jericho, the whole body of people, armed men and people, uh, turned and faced the walls of the city of Jericho. The priests lifted up their trumpets to their lips and gave a mighty resounding blast upon those trumpets and then rang out an enormous shout uh, from the people and the walls of Jericho, so long impenetrable, crumbled to the ground. And the armed men of Israel poured into the city. Jericho, a symbol of the strength of the land of Canaan, had been conquered and humbled under the hand of God by the children of Israel. Now, various attempts have been made to explain the fall of Jericho's walls by natural causes, as, for example, by suggesting that there had been some undermining of the walls of uh, Jericho, uh, perhaps by way of subsidence or by way even of an earthquake. Uh, but the truth is that Scripture uh, countenances uh, no encouragement whatsoever uh, for any such explanations. Indeed, such explanations or attempted explanations are totally inconsistent uh, with what appears in the Word of God. What occurred to the walls of Jericho was beyond question a wonder of God. The omnipotent God brought down the walls of Jericho by a wonder of his grace. God, you see, gifted the city of Jericho into the hands of the children of Israel. What occurred at Jericho is not to be explained away by natural occurrence. God was at work in the destruction of the walls of Jericho, just as he's at work in the world today on behalf of his people. So that raises the question, what was, God, what was God teaching the children of Israel through these events? And what are we to take from these events? Well, firstly, we ought to note that it was God himself, it was God himself who removed the obstacle that stood in the way of the children of Israel's enjoyment of their inheritance in the land of Canaan. 
And God does the same thing uh, today for his people. God cares for his people. He paves the way for his people. And he does that at times in ways that we could not even begin to imagine or indeed uh, do we recognise. But the reality is that God is active in our lives and he gives us the victory over our enemies and over those obstacles that also uh, prevent our enjoyment, our full enjoyment of our inheritance uh, in Jesus Christ. Every victory that the children of Israel would have in Canaan uh, was to be the doing of God. It was to be the doing of God under the leadership of the captain of the army of the Lord. In other words, other words it was the doing of God under the leadership of Jesus Christ. We ought to appreciate that there was no connection between the physical actions of the children of Israel and the collapse of the walls of Jericho. It wasn't that the children of Israel's marching around the walls somehow weakened the foundations of the walls, nor was it that the shout of the children of Israel somehow or other reverberated with such force that the noise itself produced shockwaves that caused the walls to collapse. No, no, not at all. God in his mercy and grace, God as the ever faithful God of the covenant, gave the children of Israel the victory. God brought down the walls of Jericho. The victory was the victory of God uh, for his people. Uh, this was highlighted, in fact, uh, by the very presence of the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of the people. It wasn't just the children of Israel that came against Jericho. It was God himself who compassed the city. Notice that seven priests, seven trumpets, seven days, seven times on the seventh day. Seven, the number in scripture that signifies the perfection of God's work. At Jericho, God overcame what appeared to be an insurmountable obstacle in the form of the walls of Jericho and gave the children of Israel an astounding victory over their enemies. Through the instrumentality of the children of Israel, God inflicted his just judgment upon Jericho. And brethren, we ought to understand that God is at work in the same way today. Every victory that the church of Jesus Christ enjoys, every victory that you and I enjoy over uh, our multitude of enemies is given by God. God gives us the victory over the Canaanites of our day. What form do those Canaanites take? Who or what are our enemies today? Who or what are the Canaanites that we need to drive out of our lives? The Canaanites are those things or those people that lead us or entice us to sin and that cause us to fear and not to trust in the word of God and his promises. Canaanites are those things and people that prevent us from entering fully into our inheritance in Jesus Christ. What this word of God reveals is that every victory that you and I have over uh, those Canaanites, every victory that you and I have over the sin that... Uh, uh, comes to fruition in our lives, every victory that we have over our remaining corruption, every victory that we have over the powers of darkness, all of which stand as obstacles to our enjoyment of the spiritual blessings that are ours in Jesus Christ, all of those uh, victories come from God. They come from God. 
every victory over our enemies of whatever form and from whatever source are actually wonders of God's grace. The truth is, brethren, just as was the case with the children of Israel, we're not, we're not uh, possessed of the strength and the ability to drive out the Canaanites in our own strength. Uh, they're too powerful, too well fortified. Uh, we know that. We know that from experience in our own lives. The Apostle Paul knew that same thing. That's why in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, he wrote, For I know that in me that is in my flesh, that's in my body, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. That's the struggle. That's the struggle of every believer. The desire to do that which is good, but the inability to actually do the very things that we desire. So that in the first place, every victory, every victory that we ever have over our spiritual enemies it comes from the hand of God. The second thing that God brought home to the children of Israel at Jericho was that they could only actually attain victory by faith in him. You see, there was an intimate connection between the faith of the children of Israel and the defeat of Jericho. That's not to suggest that every individual in the nation of Israel possessed such faith. But the children of Israel as a whole possessed faith in God. Uh, scripture reveals that connection in Hebrews 11 and verse 30. Now there we read, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. The children of Israel had to follow a seemingly absurd battle plan and they were to follow that battle plan of the captain of the army of the Lord by faith. And they did follow that plan by faith. You see, humanly speaking, if you analyse the plan that was given to the children of Israel, uh, humanly speaking, that plan had no prospects whatsoever of success. The walls of a city such as Jericho uh, would not fall down simply because people marched around the city uh, on seven days. And even if those people then eventually uh, shouted with an enormous shout. But nonetheless children of Israel followed the plan and they did so by faith. They believed, they believed in their hearts that the captain of the army of the Lord was the one that would lead them to victory. And they, were tr they trusted and were assured that through him, and through the power of God, they would have victory over the city of Jericho. As absurd as the plan may have seemed, the children of Israel believed what they were told by the captain of the army of the Lord. Now, that does not mean that the faith of the children of Israel actually contributed to the victory at Jericho. Uh, the faith of the children of Israel did actually not destroy the walls of Jericho. Uh, that was the doing of God. God destroyed the walls of Jericho. The marching of the people and the obedience of the people to the uh, plan of the captain of the army of the Lord in no way contributed to the demise of of Jericho. It was the power of God that caused the walls of Jericho to fall down. It was the power of God that the children of Israel looked to in faith. 
And even though it seemed absolutely ridiculous to march around the city blowing trumpets, the children of Israel laid hold on the word of God. They laid hold on the plan of the captain of the army of the Lord. They believed the word of God. They believed God and they believed the captain of the army of the Lord. And so they were obedient. They were obedient to that plan that they were given. Now, brethren, we also are to conquer our Jerichos by faith. Faith in God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the promises of God. And just as was as the case with the children of Israel, at times the way in which God calls us uh, to trust in him and to follow him and to execute his plan might seem absolutely absurd to us. After all, the plan of God really for us is that we are to use the means of grace uh, we are to seek God in prayer. Uh, we are to read and meditate upon the word of God. Uh, part of that plan is also that we are to bring ourselves under the preaching of the word of God. And we, like the children of Israel, are to place our trust in the captain of our salvation. The captain of our salvation that we've actually never met and yet we are called to obey him implicitly. Brethren, we are to conquer our Jerichos also by faith. We are to trust in God, we are to trust in his Son, and we are to trust in the way in which we are to uh, execute the uh, plan of God in order to overcome our enemies. Just as the Lord said to Joshua, so he says to us, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valour. What's the spiritual significance of what occurred at Jericho? What was the, the Lord teaching the children of Israel through these events? What's the Lord teaching us uh, through these events? teaching us to look to him. At Jericho, God revealed to the children of Israel that they could only conquer Jericho and enter into their inheritance in Canaan in his strength. He was the one who could overcome not only Jericho, but every enemy, every obstacle that stood in the way of the children of Israel entering into the blessings of Canaan. And he revealed that he was the one that would cause the walls of Jericho to fall down. He revealed that he was the one who would open the way into their rest. And brethren, that's what we also need to embrace today. Seemingly unassailable fortresses like Jericho confront us as believers. All of us encounter Jericho's spiritual enemies, spiritual obstacles that prevent us from entering fully into the blessings of the spiritual inheritance purchased for us by Jesus Christ. Brethren, if Jesus Christ is our saviour, we have an inheritance, a spiritual inheritance. Uh, through the work of God's grace, uh, we, like the children of Israel, have entered into our inheritance, but there are Jericho's enemies that prevent us from entering fully into the spiritual blessings of our inheritance. And those enemies are formidable and we encounter those enemies every day. And the truth is we can't uh, rid ourselves of those enemies in our own strength. We can't pull down uh, the walls of Jericho. As believers, brethren, 
we are engaged day by day in a spiritual battle. And the fortresses and the enemies that we have to overcome are significant. Uh, that's reflected again in that passage we looked at last Lord's Day, Ephesians 6.12, where Paul says to us, we, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The enemies that we confront, brethren, day by day are no small enemies. Uh, we face deeply entrenched strongholds of resistance to our entering into the enjoyment and the blessings of our salvation in Jesus Christ. We have a truly extraordinary salvation uh, in Jesus Christ. That's what's reflected to us in that passage we read in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, and verses 3 and following this morning. You think about it, we are, we are those who have been chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. If we are in Christ, that's who we are. Those who are chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ, who have been made to be accepted by Jesus Christ. We have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of our sins. We have a genuine spiritual inheritance. But so often, as believers, we fail to enter fully into the joy of our inheritance. As a consequence, we don't experience the blessings, the full blessings of the Christian life. In fact, life seems hard, lacking at times in any joy. Why is that? Uh, because of our enemies. There are enemies that we need to overcome, enemies that are constantly assailing us. There are fortresses that we need to destroy. Now, those enemies are, of course, many and varied. Perhaps the greatest obstacle to our entrance into and enjoyment of our spiritual inheritance actually lies within ourselves. It lies within our own hearts. It's that remaining corruption that resides within each one of us. The remaining corruption, that old man of sin, as Paul describes him, that wars incessantly against the new man, which is after God created in righteousness and true holiness. There are Jerichos within our own hearts. Paul makes reference to them also in that passage in Romans 7 when he says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Uh, but he says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. That, that's the old man of sin. The old man of sin who continually wages war against the new man of righteousness. And that old man of sin stands in the way of our full enjoyment of our spiritual blessings. That old man of sin manifests himself in so many ways in our lives, in our sinful inclinations, our worldly interests, our self-interest, our pride, our jealousy, our anger, our bitterness. Paul describes the battle in 2 Corinthians 10 and verses 4 and 5 in this way. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Many of our problems, many of our issues, brethren, are those that lie within ourselves. There's no doubt that we battle also, as Paul reminded us in Ephesians 6, we battle against spiritual wickedness in high places. We battle against the devil and his minions. But but the battle that perhaps confronts us most personally is the battle that lies within.
how are those walls that lie within to be pulled down? How are we to overcome them? It's by faith. By faith in the promises of God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the captain of our salvation. He is the one who is able to give us the victory over all of our enemies, including the enemies that lie within. Recall what Paul says at the conclusion of that passage in Romans 7. There he bemoans his inability to live as he would desire. And he says there, a wretched man that I am. And he asks this question, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Then Paul gives the answer. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. Brethren, every victory that you and I have over our spiritual enemies, every victory that you and I have over our remaining corruption, and it's true, in fact, every victory that you and I have over the kingdom of darkness comes from the hand of God. It's the work of God alone. Uh, do we have no involvement in that? The children of Israel were called to march, to march as God commanded them, to go forward in faith. And brethren, we need to do the same thing. We need to be those uh, who follow the uh, plan and purpose of God. We need to be obedient to God's word. We need to use the means of grace. Uh, that means we need to pray, to beseech the Lord, to plead with him uh, that he might reveal himself to us in the face of Jesus Christ. We must plead for his help and for his assistance. We need to be those that read the word of God. We need to meditate upon that word. We need to apply that word uh, to our souls. We need to obey that word. and We need to obey that word even when uh, the way that God sets before us doesn't seem actually to make much sense to us. Brethren, we, we, like the children of Israel, need to step out in faith. At times it may seem futile, even ridiculous. But remember... By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. The children of Israel's victory over Jericho uh, was an assured victory. And so too is our victory over our Jerichos. You see the assured nature of the victory of the children of Israel in verse 2. We read there, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valour. See, says the Lord to Joshua. And by that word, see, it means here is something not to be overlooked or to be missed. God draws a special attention to this. I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valour. Notice that the Lord does not say, I will uh, give into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valour. Uh, that, that would be an encouraging statement if the Lord would simply say, I will do that. But God does not say, I will give into thine hand. But God says, I have given. I have given into thine hand, Jericho. 
past tense. It's an accomplished fact. And when you think about that, I have given is much better than I will. What that indicates is that the victory is assured. The victory has already been secured. According to the word of the Lord, according to the word of the captain of the army of the Lord, the matter is finished. The outcome is assured. It cannot be changed. The children of Israel would have the victory. And the same, brethren, is true for us. Uh, yes, there will be Jerichos that we will confront. And yes, those Jerichos will uh, prove to be obstacles and will imp impede us in our uh, full enjoyment of the blessings of our inheritance. And yes, we will need to fight. We will need to be engaged in the battle. Just as the children of Israel had to fight to secure the land of Canaan. And so there will be battles in which we will need to fight. But we ought to fight those battles in the assured confidence that the victory, our victory, is already accomplished. It is an already accomplished fact. You see, the truth is the Lord has already determined the outcome of the battle. It's not a question of whether victory uh, will or might be attained. It's not a question whether our enemies may or can be overcome. The truth is that our enemies have been overcome and the victory has been attained. Where did that occur? That occurred at the cross. The Lord says to us uh, in this word today, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valour. What's our calling? Our calling is to step forward in faith. Take hold of Jesus Christ and to look to him for the victory. Look to the captain of our salvation. We can't confront our Jerichos in our own strength, but we can in the strength of God and in the strength of the captain of our salvation. So, brethren, let us as we encounter enemies even in this coming week, let us look in faith to the finished work of our captain and let us more and more enter into the blessedness and joy of our spiritual inheritance. Amen. Let's uh, stand uh, for a brief word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, there is none of us uh, here who have any uh, understanding of spiritual things uh, who don't realise that uh, we are day by day engaged in a spiritual uh, no-holds-barred contest. It's a, it's a contest, uh, in fact, really for our souls. Uh, and we, we struggle at times, Lord, to... Uh, gain the ascendancy in that battle. And all of us know those times in our own lives when uh, particularly the old man of sin uh, seems to hold sway to some measure in our own lives. And though we be new creatures in Jesus Christ, yet that old man of sin is not easily subdued. At times he actually uh, leads us into... Uh, paths that are not good and are not right, paths that are destructive, uh, that uh, hold us back from 
enjoying the uh, benefits and the blessings of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, this is a struggle that we face every day. And so our prayer is is that uh, you uh, might uh, come to us through your word even this day, encourage us uh, not to look to self, not to look to our strength, but to look to our Saviour, Jesus Christ, because in him the victory is assured. Yes, we will have to engage in warfare. We will have to fight. At times we may suffer even uh, wounds in that battle, but the victory is assured. Uh, We are those who, by your grace, not only in this life will enjoy the benefits and blessings of our inheritance, but we will be those who will enjoy that inheritance to its full uh, when we meet with thee in glory. So, Lord, that's that's our hope. That's our prayer. Uh, let, let us be those then who step forward day by day in the faith of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We pray these things for his name's sake. Amen.